I invite you today to open up to, uh, well, John chapter 18 is where you can turn first. John chapter 18, if you want to turn there. I don't know how many of you have heard about the terrible thing that happened to our United States gold medal swimmer, Ryan Lochte, while he was at the Rio Olympics. He and a few other swimmers, they were innocently taking a cab ride. And as they were in this cab ride, the cab was violently pulled over by thieves. And they were forced to get out of the cab and get down on their knees in the middle of the street. And as they were, one of the thieves put a gun right on Ryan Lochte's forehead and he cocked the trigger and he robbed him. It was hard. Okay, well, apparently he didn't put the gun right on his forehead. But they were waving the gun as they were on their knees there in the street. What's that? Okay, so there, okay. Sometimes there's confusion. So they were never on their knees in the street, but when they they had pulled into a gas station, and as soon as they got out of the car, these robbers came up. To the, what? Bill, I'm. Tr- oh, all right, all right. So they actually. Went, got out of the car and went into the bathroom. But as they came out of the bathroom, these robbers then attacked them. And the robbers came at them. And what t- Wait a minute. So, so then it's like, wait. So, so, so then it's, all right. So apparently there was no robbery. And... When they went in the bathroom, they vandalized the bathroom and they were paying for the repairs. So I got that right. Okay. Thanks, Bill. I appreciate that. (laughs) Boy, I built my whole sermon on that. What do I... uh... (laughs) The story that I began with is the absolute true story that Ryan Lochte shared on NBC television Sunday, August the 14th. And then it changed a little bit. And it changed a little bit. And by Friday, August the 19th on NBC, Al Roker said there was no robbery. There was no pullover. There was no gun to his head. He lied. We've been looking at questions that were asked to Jesus. And in John chapter 18 and verse 38, in John chapter 18 and verse 38, Pilate said to him, what is truth? We'll come back to John 18 in a bit, but I invite you to turn back to Genesis 4. And if you happen to... I don't really anticipate anybody does here. But if you happen to log all the scripture places I take you in an Excel spreadsheet, you will probably find that I take you to Genesis 4 often, right? Genesis 3 often. Why? Because I like to turn there because Genesis 4 is the very first generation of human beings that were born to human parents. Because we often hear people say, boy, this world has gotten so bad. And we recognize that in, that's a relative statement. Certainly, there are societies that are close to Scripture and then they move away from it. But the human race, we were bad from the moment we fell in the garden. And the very first generation is one that's always good to look at. And Cain, and I know we've turned here before, even in this series, Cain kills his brother Abel, murders him. Verse 8, Cain, Genesis 4, 8, Cain told Abel, his brother, came about when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. Verse 9, then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And Cain stops for a moment. 
and says, let me think here. I don't remember seeing God at the crime scene. So what is it that he knows? What is it that he can prove? See, hmm. See, uh, you know, what has he found Abel's body yet? Maybe he doesn't have a body yet. He's just trying to throw stuff on the wall and see what sticks like a detective, right? You know, maybe he doesn't have enough to convict me yet. I'm certainly not going to incriminate myself with the truth. And so what does Cain do? He did what sinful Vincent McDonald has done before. I can remember standing there, my dad saying, so what did you do? Okay, what did I do? Was there anybody there that, knew, that knows him? Is there anybody there he's going to be able to get another side of the story from? Right? Cain says, I don't know. What do, what do you mean, where's my brother Abel? Am I my brother's keeper? And through the centuries, the temptation to hide and to twist the truth has devastated our world. We want to begin this morning by recognizing this. We need truth to be able to function. We need it. Truth is critical for us to sustain a healthy, peaceful, just society. And sadly for us, We have come to a point where we realize that people can say, well, wait a minute, we want to be transparent and we want to show the truth. And yet they're only saying that because we know that they've already wiped away any evidence of what the real truth is. And so we're going to show you the facts. And we we sit there going, how would we know? In 1 Kings chapter 3, right? In 1 Kings chapter 3. 1 Kings chapter 3 and verse 16. Two women who were harlots came to King Solomon and they stood before him. And the one woman said, Oh my Lord, this woman and I live in the same house. And I gave birth to a child while she was in the house. And it happened on the third day after I gave birth. This woman also gave birth to a child. We were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, only the two of us. And so we've got nobody corroborate our story. Just the two of us there in the house, verse 19 of 1 Kings 3, this woman's son died in the night because she lay on it, and so she arose in the middle of the night, took my son from beside me while your maidservant slept, and laid him in her bosom. I laid her dead son in my bosom when I rose in the morning, or she laid her dead son in my bosom when I arose in the morning to nurse my son. Behold, he was dead. When I looked at him carefully in the morning, it wasn't my son. The other woman said, no, for the living one is my son, and the dead one is your son. First woman said, no, for the dead one is your son and the living one is my son. King Solomon sits there and, right? There's no DNA testing available yet. I love DNA testing. It's a wonderful thing. The study of DNA has shown us that we are fearfully and wonderfully made and how incredible God's design is in the smallest layer. But the problem with DNA is we need it because we're not truthful. I, I, I love technology. Uh, you know, we're ordering ourselves as a church. We're ordering more video cameras. But the reason we need video cameras is because we're not truthful as people. I don't mean necessarily you specifically. I'm saying society, right? What does Solomon do? Solomon says, okay, here's what I'm going to do. Bring me the child. I'm going to cut it in half. The one woman says, no, don't cut it in half. Let it live. And he says, the other woman says, okay, cut it in half. We both get half of it. And Solomon says, obviously, it's not your child. It's her child. And boy, great wisdom. But it's not always easy to do that, right? And our struggle to discern truth has led to tremendous fractions, right? Tragic events happen and they tear us apart. Because there have been times when police officers have not told the truth and they have covered up injustice and they have gotten away with it. And there are times 
when eyewitnesses on the scene have lied about the details of the scene and have covered up the truth and a riot has ensued against the police. Why? Either one. Because how do we discern the truth? The truth. We need truth. We need it. And we wrestle because we, 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 we struggle with it and we struggle in business. Right? I was a salesman years ago and I, I remember saying, I'm not saying I was perfect, but I, because re, I remember the temptation, but by the grace of God, I, I'm saying to the guy, look, it's going to be six weeks for those doors and he's saying, the other guy's telling me four. And I'm thinking, I know he's getting them from the same place. So I'll say four. But really it's six. And I said to the guy, I, then I guess you go with him because I'm telling you it's six. Right? Four weeks later, he calls me. Hey, listen, can you get me those doors, right? Because uh, he told me four, but now he's, he's telling me it's another two weeks. Like you said, it was going to be six, so I'd rather go with you. So can you get them for me in two weeks? And I said, no, it'll be six weeks, right? Because you didn't order them four weeks ago, right? But, but in business, can, can, I, can we trust? Really? Am I really going to be able to ride that car out of there for only $79 a month? Uh. Family. Where were you last night? I couldn't get a hold of you. Oh, oh yeah. Well, I, I, sure. I, I was, uh, my phone died. And I was... And we struggle. We wrestle. Because we know we need truth. To be able to function. And as Christians, we need to commit to it. Uh, the world around us needs to see, even if it's at our expense, that when you're dealing with Christians, they're truthful. But the, the need for truth in our relationships points us to something deeper. Right? That there's a deeper need. I need truth about Life itself, right? The need for truth shows me that I need truth about the very existence. I need truth to walk on this earth with others, but I need truth to know where did this earth come from? Why am I here? See, there's a truth for daily living, but there's a deeper truth that's about life itself. Is there a truth that defines life for me? Is there a truth that secures life for me? And every generation needs that. And I know sociologists, psychologists, they'll write stories and, you know, the church is, is in trouble because this next generation doesn't want church and they don't, you know, they don't want being told this or that. Listen, every generation has a hole inside and they are hungering for something that's true. I believe there's a generation growing in our midst that's saying, if you're telling me that there's no truth, that I have come from nowhere, that I'm just an accident, that we're not going anywhere, that I, whew, then what's life about? Every generation hungers, is there truth? Can I know why I'm here? Can I know how I got here? Can I know how I'm supposed to live with other people? And I believe there absolutely is that truth. And if it wasn't for the word of God, I would not be standing here. Because I have nothing of my own to offer anybody. That's the second thing is we find truth. If you look at Psalm 19. Psalm 19. For in the 19th Psalm, the psalmist speaks to us about Scripture and declares to us what he knows to be true about Scripture. It is God telling us through David where we can find truth. For in Psalm 19 and verse 7, we read this. The law of the Lord is perfect, restoring the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure. Making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right. Rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure. Enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean. Enduring forever. 
The judgments of the Lord are true. They are righteous altogether. You may say, every day I watch Dr. Phil and I get some insight. Judge Judy has taught me a lot. You know, or, or, or whoever it is that you, that you, whoever, you know, the view that you want to hold or whatever. Listen, if you're not reading scripture, this is, David tells us what God wants us to know. There is an absolute truth that you can build your life upon. It's the word of God. Now, I'm well aware That there are more people in this world who don't believe Psalm 19 than those of us who do. I know that. I don't expect an unbeliever to have a biblical world life view. But I certainly know the difference a biblical world life view has made for me. To be able to let scripture lay out for me. How I see life and the world and how I live in it. The Bible makes clear that the human body that I'm talking with right now, this wasn't an accidental collection of dust. The living God of all creation molded it. It came out of his head. Generally speaking, right, that, that b- before sin, certainly, right, you know, that, that before the, 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 the impacts on us, right, God, how he designed the body to be working. It's molded, it's crafted. This me, who Vincent really is, deep inside, right, that invisible soul that I can't touch, God breathed that into me. It was God breathed into Adam, passed on right through to each and every one. The soul. Whew, I, 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 I let that affect me. It impacts how I view the world. I get up in the morning. I know why I'm here, what I'm about. There's meaning. There's purpose. There's truth to stand upon in everything. I was speaking to a fellow. Um, who is who didn't believe in scripture. And if somebody doesn't believe in scripture, I'm not going to hold them to what scripture says. What I mean, I'm going to tell them scripture says you're going to stand before God. It's going to happen whether you believe it or not. But but I'm not going to fight with them, you know, in certain ways, but I said this to him. I said, "Let me ask you something now. Why is it wrong for me to break into your house?" Murder you and steal all your stuff. And he looked at me. Because if it's wrong, because it's against the law. He knew. Well, that opens himself up to what? We change the laws. And it's okay. Right? Maybe there's a group of people that we make it legal. That you're allowed to break into their house and murder them and steal their stuff. What if it's just... The majority of people, we as a country believe it's wrong. Okay, then he would have opened himself up to what? Well, what happens when the vote, as we've seen in our country, things used to be wrong that the majority of people don't think are wrong anymore, and so now they're not wrong, right? Now, don't misunderstand me. We've also corrected some things in our country through the years. Views that we had that were wrong, that were made, you know, correct or whatever. But, but... Here's what he answered me. He said this. Well, it would be wrong because we have evolved into an enlightened society that knows that it is morally wrong to do that. And I said, okay. So then, if that's true, then that means there may well have been a point in that period of our evolution where it wasn't wrong. And he said... Okay. And I said, and so then that means since we're still evolving, there may come a point in our evolution where it's not wrong anymore. Well, now you're being ridiculous. But what was I getting at? Where, what do you base truth on? What is your standard for truth? What do you base it on? 
Where do you stand? Psalm 19 says you can stand on Scripture. It's true. You can trust it. It's reliable. It's permanent. It's absolute. And Jesus responds to that and adds to that in Matthew chapter 7. Because what does he say to us in Matthew chapter 7? And he gives us a clue as to why his words are true. Because they are coming from his mouth, from the mouth of God. For in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Matthew chapter 7, the first gospel in the New Testament, verse 24. We read this. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell and the wind and the floods came and the winds blew and slammed against that house and it fell and great was its fall. See, Ryan Lochte looked into the camera and he said, my story is true. And we came to realize that just because somebody is a famous athlete doesn't mean that we should believe what they said is true. Jesus says, you can trust my words. Why? Because I'm not going anywhere. When I was growing up, you know, my history books may be different than yours are today, right? Or what we were, yeah, I guess you say history books, the your history books will be different than mine because it was happening currently for me, right? Richard Nixon. Whew, that name, Richard Nixon. Leonid Brezhnev. Oof. I don't think I ever smiled. He was always Leonid Brezhnev. You know, he's the Russian leader, right? Mao Zedong. You know, it was hard enough to say his name, but we didn't know anything about China at the time. It was like a closed society. Gold in my ear, right? Israel. Those names. Nixon. Brezhnev, St. Tong, my ear. You know what? It doesn't matter what any of them thought was true. Because they're not here anymore. They're gone. Jesus says, you can build on my words. Because I'm not going anywhere. My words are true because I am the truth. I am the truth. The truth, and that's the last thing we want to close with. If you turn back to John chapter 18, because that's, it, it, it was in that personal, if you want to say confrontation, conversation, interaction, that Pontius Pilate had with Jesus that led to the question we began with, what is truth? In John chapter 18 and verse 33, we read, Therefore Pilate entered into the praetorium and summoned Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you about me? Pilate answered, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests delivered you to me. What have you done? And Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. Therefore, Pilate said to him, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born. And for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth hears my voice. Pilate said to him, what is the truth? Pilate is standing here face to face with the truth. And I believe there is a genuine battle going on in Pilate's heart and soul. I know there are some who kind of think that Pilate's saying it as a jest. Ah, what is truth, you know. But secular history tells us that Pilate at this point in his life and career 
has already been growing frustrated with Roman politics. He's supposed to be in charge here and Herod has gone over his head and he's had to back down because of money exchanging hands and what he, he realizes his career may have hit a plateau and what's going on here and he's been frustrated where he is he's been wrestling with power I don't know where you are in life it doesn't have to be that you're into it a long ways sometimes it's after we finally finish school maybe it's after you graduate high school or maybe it's after you graduate college and you're at that first job and you find yourself saying, so is this the rest of my life? Like, I was always going, you know, it was seventh grade. I'm going to eighth grade next year. Now, ooh, now high school. All right, now college. And now the rest of my life. And, and that hits people sometimes. Maybe it's hit you. Maybe it's you've been further along and you've climbed in your career, and but you're kind of like, all right. Or maybe you faced a lot of disappointment and rejection and at one point you had that spouse and that house and whatever and now you don't have that spouse and that house and, and, and you're just, what, what's, what's, what's really true? He was sick of the chief priests too. He was sick of uh, their lust for money and power and, and of their hypocrisy. Because imagine how Pilate's feeling. If you look there at John chapter 18, look back at verse 28, right? Then they led Jesus from Caiaphas into the praetorium, and it was early, and they themselves did not enter into the praetorium so that they would not be defiled, but might eat the Passover. Therefore, Pilate has to go out to them. Picture Pilate, perhaps, a sense of, you know... I'm too dirty for you to come into my house. But you've come here so that I'll murder a man for you. So, so what's dirtier? Right? And, and for what, 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 you know, just this sense of what am I dealing with? As a matter of fact, let's, you know, I, I, I'm moving along here, but, but hold your place in John 18. Turn back to Matthew chapter 27. Because I just think it is good to see one other thing in Matthew chapter 27 for what may be happening inside of Pilate because it may be happening inside of you. Who can I count on? Who can I rely on? I, I couldn't count on my parents, but I could always count on my grandfather. And now he's gone. What, who do I turn to? I thought for sure that person would never lie to me. And they did. Matthew chapter 27 and verse 11. Now Jesus stood before the governor and the governor questioned him. It's the same story. It's just Matthew sharing it in a little different way. Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus said to him, it is as you say. And while he was being accused by the chief priests and elders, he did not answer. Then Pilate said to him, do you not hear the many things that they testify against you? Pilate knows they're lying about you. Verse 14, and he did not answer him with regard to even a single charge. So the governor was quite amazed. And we look further in Matthew chapter 27 and verse 18. Pilate's dealing with them and we read, for he, that is Pilate, knew that they, because of their envy, they had handed him over. He knows their motives. Verse 19, add to it, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message saying, have nothing to do with that righteous man. For last night I suffered greatly in a dream because of him. Whew, something's going on with Pilate. There is something different about this Jesus. As a matter of fact, there is something true about him. My wife is saying, stay away from him. He even got into her dreams. Alfred Edersheim in his book shares this. Pilate, in whom we mark a strange reluctance to proceed, perhaps because his soul is being restrained by a higher hand. It was as if two powers were contending for the mastery of Pilate's heart. Frank Morrison, who was 
he, he, he was a skeptic. He didn't believe in, in God at all. Like Lee Strobel, like uh, others, he went to prove that the resurrection of Jesus was a lie. And he ended up coming to faith in Christ. And he wrote a book called Who Moved the Stone? Because that became a question for him that there was no answer to, right? He said this, Pilate was a man torn between the call of two worlds like we are. And back in John 18 and verse 33, Pilate says, Are you king of the Jews? Again, Edersheim says this, And now Christ in his desire to stretch out to salvation to Pilate questions him. Verse 34, Jesus answered, are you saying this on your own initiative or did others tell you this about me? Jesus, in essence, says to Pilate, Pilate, do you want to know the truth about me? Or are you just asking it as a legal question? Pilate, you personally, because it's you and me right now, do you really want to know the truth about who I am? And he asked that of you. Pilate hears what he says and Pilate answers, right? I'm not a Jew, am I? Your own nation, the chief priests. You know, I don't care if you're the king of the Jews. I'm not a Jew. It doesn't matter to me. And look what Jesus says, because the stage is now set for Jesus to confront Pilate with the truth. And again, he confronts you today, my friend. Jesus says this, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants would be fighting so that I would not be handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not of this realm. You say correctly that I am a king. For this I have been born and for this I have come into the world to testify to the truth. Jesus says it is not a question about being a Jew. I am not Here, just as the king of the Jews, I am here as the king of a kingdom that goes beyond this earthly world. I am the king for everyone who will turn to me. I came into the world to declare the truth, the truth that God so loved the world that he gave me his only begotten son and that whoever believes in him will never perish but have everlasting life. And Pilate hears him and yet says, what is truth? How do I believe that? And I don't know where Pilate went. We know that he turns at that moment to the, to the case in hand again. But I don't, I know where I went with it. It's up to you where you go with it. Because I said, I remember sitting there in that pew. And I remember Pastor Herb Mitchell. You who knew Pastor Herb Mitchell, right? And he would do that. Listen to me, soul. right? (laughs) Those of you who heard him preach, right? And he stood right about here and he said, now listen. Jesus said, I am the way. And he pointed at that window. The truth and the life. No one comes to the Father. Unless they come through me. And that's the truth. And we must face the truth. And he says, he who has the son hath life, but whoever doesn't, does not. What will you do with Jesus Christ? You have the right to say, I don't believe that book. And you have the right to go, go on searching. But scripture declares, this is where you will find truth that is sure. This is where you will find the living truth who comes to you through his living word. And he says, anyone who comes to me, I won't cast you out. Right? There is no other name under heaven given among men where you can be saved. But at the name of Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads. Dear friend. Have you responded to the truth? Because there is only one truth. The truth that will set you free. Jesus is the eternal truth. He is the only one who is qualified to take your sin upon himself and to pay the price for it. And he did. 
And as we sang the verses of the prophecy of Isaiah, Come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, I will make them white as snow. I'll cleanse them. He wants to do that for you today. For Jesus Christ paid the price for your sin. And in this moment in your life with our heads bowed, you can turn to him and say, Almighty God, I believe I have heard the truth today. Jesus, I sense you here talking to my soul. Jesus, I confess my sin before you. I believe that you died to be my Savior. I believe you're the truth. I put all my faith in you today. Won't you pray that prayer, dear friend? Oh God, I confess my sin. I'm unworthy. Just pray it in your own heart to the Lord. I'm unworthy of your forgiveness. But I believe you put all my sin on Jesus and he paid the price. I put all my faith in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Oh God, I believe that's the truth. Save me. Perhaps you did pray that prayer this morning. Perhaps while we've been sitting here right now, you opened up your life to the eternal truth that has now opened up heaven's doors for you forever. If so, God has just made you his child. As we sit here with our heads bowed, would you give me the joy of just being able to rejoice that God did that? You don't have to, but I'm asking, if you prayed that prayer, would you just, as we're bowing our heads, would you just slip up your hand real quick and put it down and give me a thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Any others as we sit? Father, we thank you. Oh, <laughs> oh Lord, to be able to lay our head on the pillow at night and know the truth, Herb Mitchell is in heaven. To know the truth, behold what manner of love the Father has given to us, that we are children of God. Whew. Praise you. In the name of Jesus we pray.